All right, here we are, successful stewardship. Uh, this is lesson number four in the series. Uh, title of this lesson, The Principles of the Plate. Well, this is the uh, fourth and final lesson in our series uh, on the subject of uh, stewardship. And in this series, uh, we've reviewed several ideas about uh, Christian uh, stewardship, primarily that uh, stewardship uh, is the care and the management of someone else's property. In our case, as Christians, we're responsible for managing and distributing the wealth that God gives to us. And so in lesson number one, uh, we talked about motivation. What is it that motivates our giving as good stewards? And we said, well, it certainly is not uh, guilt or pride or anything like that, but we are motivated by the Holy Spirit in our uh, stewardship uh, efforts. Uh, in the second lesson, we talked about uh, motivate, excuse me, not motivation, but we studied uh, tithing, uh, the Old Testament method of giving. And we uh, also reviewed the New Testament about how we should give as, uh, as Christians. Uh, the third lesson, uh, we talked about um, uh, stewardship. And I showed you a plan, a plan for good stewardship and how we could become good stewards, not only in our giving, but in all of our responsibilities uh, regarding the management of our affairs as Christians, how we should think and act and how we should feel if we wish to be good stewards. In this uh, last lesson, uh, I'd like to go over fundamental principles about giving that transcend culture and time. These are truths about giving that are valid at all times and I call these truths the principles of the plate. And when I talk about the plate, of course, I'm talking about you know, the collection plate. So principles of the plate. Let's just get right into those uh, uh, at the beginning of our lesson here today. Uh, plate principle uh, number one is this. The more you give, the more you get. The more you give, the more you get. This is a timeless principle. The more you give, the more you get. The Bible is filled with the basic principles that guide our lives, that are true in whatever generation we're in, whatever culture we're in. And one of these is the principle of increased return. You cannot outgive God, impossible. In Malachi, the prophet Malachi, in Malachi's day, the people had forgotten this idea and they were cutting back on their giving and they were offering inferior sacrifices and God reminded them that they were just robbing themselves of potential blessings. They weren't robbing him, they were robbing themselves. We read in Malachi chapter three, verses nine and 10, Malachi writes, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Jesus, of course, reinforces this idea of increased return in a passage in Luke chapter six, verse 38. He says, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And so giving is an expression of faith. It says, I believe enough in what I don't see to give up some of what I do see. You know, some people think that the more you give, the more of the same that you get back. You know, the more money you give, the more money you'll get back, or the more, you, you know, the more generous you are, the healthier you'll be, and so on and so forth. This uh, is true to a certain extent. Uh, generosity begets generosity. But the true reward of giving is that the more you give up of what you see, the better able you are to see the one who is hidden. Because the reward of generous giving is a better vision of God, a better ability to know God. And the more we know God, the more we trust, the more we trust, the stronger our faith, the stronger our faith, of course, it just all plays into this. The stronger our faith, the more we can give, and and just keeps going. Plate principle number two. It is more blessed to give than to receive. We've heard this many times, but it's a timeless principle. It works in every generation. 
In the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul the Apostle quotes a saying of Jesus that is not found in the gospel, a beatitude, if you wish, that could have quite easily fitted into the Sermon on the Mount, this, this idea here, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Of course, the suggestion here is that taking is pleasurable in its own right. I mean, receiving is good. It feels good to receive. It builds our esteem uh, to be given uh, gifts. Uh, and it's easy to receive and it's profitable to be the one who's getting stuff. That's, you know, who doesn't like to receive? But like all the Beatitudes, this passage reveals a truth about the workings of the kingdom of God, not easily um, seen by an unbeliever or the casual observer. As far as giving is concerned, this here teaches us that it feels better than the feeling you have when you receive. The feeling when you give is better than the feeling you have when you receive. That's the point. Uh, it builds our souls when we give. We build up our character. Receiving gifts and receiving stuff doesn't build up our character. It builds up our bank account maybe, or it builds up the amount of stuff that we have, but it doesn't build our character. Giving, however, does build our character. And although sometimes uh, giving is difficult or inconvenient and sacrificial, giving is much more profitable than receiving. I mean, when you give, uh, giving benefits both the receiver and the giver, two people are benefited. And giving pleases God and thus gives joy to the giver in the affirming of the fact that he is doing uh, what is right. Uh, giving also guards the soul against greed. You know, giving, regular giving, being a generous person, this is the antidote to the poison of envy. And as Paul says here, giving puts us into the spirit of Christ who came to give his life and not, you know, he came to give and he gave his life. He didn't come to take. So I think the people who don't give, you know, at church, for example, or are stingy in life, um, are denying themselves of a pleasure and a joy that would free them from fear and jealousy and selfishness and the misery that comes with these kind of attitudes. I ask you something, have you ever noticed that giving people are happy people? Yeah, the people that give generously usually have a pleasant disposition. Uh, not too many sour pusses are uh, generous uh, people. Uh, something about giving that continually enriches and buoys the, 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 the soul and the character to be, to be cheerful. Uh, principle of the plate number three, God provides for your giving. Now the ironic thing about giving is that we never give what is ours anyways. If we just have that in mind, it would help us loosen the purse strings. Uh, whatever we have, God has freely and cheerfully given it to us. He's given us everything that we have, all of it. Uh, we read in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10 to 14, we read the following. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you and from your hand we have given to you. So David understood the idea that God had everything. I mean, not only does he have all power and majesty, but he owns everything because he's created everything. And he's kind of, asking a, a question here, you know, who are we you know, to be giving you generously, to be giving you something generously? We're only giving to you what you've already given to us. Okay. And so uh, the fact that people don't acknowledge this truth or uh, are not generous or don't give anything at any time 
does not change this basic truth. You know, if a person is selfish and never gives anything, it doesn't, it doesn't change the truth that everything he has has been given to him by, by God. In the New Testament, Paul expresses this principle in a different way, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, so let's read that. He writes, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So Paul is saying here, this is not just a passing comment. It's an explanation of how God works, how this business of giving works from God's perspective. We need to pay attention on how the system um, operates that Paul is describing and which David was talking about. Well, the system works in the following way. We need to realize that God is able to provide everything. You know, God is able to provide everything that we need, whether it's material goods or spiritual or emotional. He's the source for all things. Both writers declare this. Secondly, not only will God provide for your needs, he will also provide for your giving. That's the interesting thing about this passage. I think we, we can all understand the idea that God provides for us what we need, but Paul and David uh, make the point that God even provides extra so that we have something to give, so that we can experience the joy of giving. God even provides for that experience in our life. And then thirdly, God will take care of us and give us an abundance so that once our needs are cared for, we can glorify Him and bless ourselves by doing good deeds and supplying for others. It's like I have so many needs, God provides for all of those needs, and one of the needs that I have is to be able to give. And He also supplies extra so that I have something to offer, something to give, and thus you know, bless myself in the giving. The problem that we have is that we always invest our extra income and our extra talents and our extra time, we, in, we usually invest those things into ourselves. The sin here is using what God has entrusted to us in the service of others in the pursuit of our own comfort and pleasure. In other words, that portion that God has given us extra so that we can uh, experience the joy of giving, many times we use that portion for ourselves. And we rob ourselves of the experience and the rewards that come with uh, giving uh, to others. Of course, the sin here is using what God has entrusted to us in the service of others, as I said, in the pursuit of our own interests. The Bible assures us that God can and will provide for everything we need to live, whether it's money or food or family or leisure or health care, whatever it is, but it also instructs us to recognize the fact that not all of what we have is just for us. Some of it has been given to us in order to give to others, and God will require this of us. And this idea brings me to uh, plate principle uh, number four. Uh, we will be judged based on our giving. We will be judged based on our giving. Now I can already hear you know, people answering this, you know, this, this principle here. They're saying, wait a minute, we're saved by faith in Christ, not by how much we give. I mean, you know, if we're judged by how much we give, th those are works. You know, we're not judged by works. And that's correct. Uh, what is needed, however, is a, a kind of balance in this understanding of salvation. James, for example, says, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. There's a balance there between faith and works. You know, faith is demonstrated through works. Works all by themselves with no faith cannot save us. Faith all by itself, without works, without a demonstration, can't save us. As James says, 
it, it is th these two things working together. I don't give in order to save my soul. I give because I love the Lord. I give because it's a demonstration of my faith. My faith in Christ must be expressed somehow. And Jesus tells us that it is, it is expressed or shown to be genuine in a variety of ways, not just giving. For example, in uh, Mark chapter 16, 16, Jesus says that if we believe, uh, then we'll be baptized. You know, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. And so baptism uh, is an expression of my faith. I'm baptized in order to demonstrate my faith, to express my faith in Jesus. In John 14, 23, John says that if you, uh, or Jesus says that if you love him, you will obey his word. Well then, obedience, therefore, that also is an expression of faith, right? When I, when I make an effort to obey the Lord, why am I doing that? Well, I'm doing that to demonstrate that I, I believe. I believe, therefore, I obey the Lord. I do my best to obey the Lord. In Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, Jesus says that when He returns, the disciples He will take to heaven with Him are those who did what? Well, they fed the hungry, they clothed the naked, they visited the sick and the imprisoned. You know, not, not, not the ones who just believed that he was the Son of God, but did nothing about it except sing about it and listen to a bunch of sermons about it. Not just those guys. It's not that giving replaces faith or that much giving can pay for Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. No, his sacrifice is priceless. Nothing can replace that. Giving is a barometer of our faith. It registers how strong or how weak our faith really is because it measures our deeds, not just our words. Very important principle to remember. And then plate principle number five. Giving determines the growth of the church. In the book of Acts, we watch the explosive growth of the church in, in Jerusalem at the beginning. Note that this growth was, was fueled by two main factors. Number one, the preaching and the miracles done by the apostles. And number two, the tremendous generosity of the church. We read a couple of you know, samples of this. In Acts 2, verses 43 to 45, we read, everyone, and here everyone means everyone in the church, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. So there's the preaching and the miracles you know, being done by the apostles. But note what Luke writes, he says, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. So you have three people, 3,000 people rather, who are baptized on the same day do you not think that among those 3,000 people, there are people who are poor, people who are sick, there are people who are widowed by themselves, you know, who are alone, who are destitute, aside from people who are employed and people who are wealthy and people who are well married, you know, don't you think there were needs among those 3,000 people? And as the church continued to grow, you know, pretty soon they were 5,000. Don't, don't, you, don't you think there were tremendous needs there? How do, you, how do you think they took care of those needs? Well, it's, you know, Luke writes here, people sold their possessions in order to get money, in order to you know, pay for the needs uh, of, the, uh, of the church. In Acts chapter four, verse 32, we read, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. See, there's the preaching again. But note what else was going on. And abundant grace was upon them all, for there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So it's pretty clear here what they were doing, right? They were selling their property and taking the money and they were giving it to the apostles uh, to take care of the needs of the church. So preaching, 
the gospel, uh, the, 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 the miracles that the apostles were doing, but also tremendous uh, giving and generosity uh, by the congregation. In Acts chapter six, verse one, it says, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint rose, arose upon, uh, um, on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. The point I want to make here is that um, uh, we, we read about this in, in Acts chapter six about you know, the widows being fed. And I want to read one more passage here, verse seven. It says, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So in Acts chapter six, we read that uh, you know, the church kept growing and one of the problems was they were distributing food to the widows uh, on a daily basis. And uh, some widows, it seemed, were being overlooked. The Hellenistic uh, widows were the, the widows who were um, not native uh, of Judea. They were, they were individuals who were born elsewhere, but now you know, uh, were in Judea, and some felt that they were not being taken care of. The point I want to make is we read on in uh, Acts chapter six that uh, the apostles, uh, you know, the congregation selected and the apostles uh, confirmed seven men uh, who would take care of the uh, daily feeding of these uh, widows. And we read about this all the time. We say, oh yeah, those were the first deacons, seven men. But do you stop and think for a moment? They required seven men in order to manage the ministry of the feeding of the widows. Do you realize how many widows they must have had? in order to you know, require seven men in order to you know, feed them on a regular basis? Do you also imagine the amount of money or the amount of resources that it required in order to you know, fund a program like that? So uh, the point I want to make with all of this is that preaching, and they were preaching the gospel and doing miracles, but preaching without giving won't help the church to grow because growth requires services and services require resources. That's the point I'm trying to make. And giving without preaching won't do it either because the word is what converts souls, not money. Okay, so what is needed is solid preaching yoked together with sacrificial giving in order to produce dynamic growth. Because dynamic preaching draws people to Christ People are converted, but people who are converted and as the church grows, then the needs grow. And when the needs grow, then the resources are required to take care of those needs. That's why I say uh, Bible-based preaching plus dynamic giving, sacrificial giving, will uh, produce uh, dynamic growth. Uh, a very important principle in uh, church growth, um, in church growth uh, teaching. Um, so pressing on to maturity in the area of giving requires us to understand and implement these plate principles, five quick ideas that help guide us in our giving. I want to review them one more time with you. Um, the more you give away, the greater your blessings from God. And the exhortation here is try it. Try to outgive God. Try it as an experiment for yourselves. Give more and, and watch what happens. See how God blesses you. See how uh, your life changes if you make the decision to be a more giving person, not just, oh, I'm going to increase $10 you know, in the plate per week. Well, that's fine, that's good, but I'm saying try being a more generous person and see what happens. Principle number two, Giving provides certain rewards that receiving cannot experience. There are certain things that you experience that you can only experience it through giving. All the receiving in the world will not give you that experience. Again, I encourage you to try that. Experience it for yourself. See if the Lord is not faithful to bless you as you become a more giving person. Principle number three, 
God gives to you so you can give to others and receive the blessing. What we need to do is identify the portion of our income or that actually belongs to God. You know, in the Old Testament, one of the things about the tithe, you know, we always talk about the tithe. Well, for the Jews, the 10%, you know, the tithe, that wasn't considered giving, that was a tax. You had to give that, that was, you owed that to the Lord, period. You, know. you only gave when you, you know, when you started giving beyond 10%, that's when your giving actually started. That first 10%, that was a tax. Then you had the, like the newborn tax, you know, for the firstborn tax, you had to pay that as well. So we have to understand that God will provide what we need in every area of life, but He will also provide for us what we need in order to give. What we need to do is identify the portion that we're planning to give to God and give that regularly. Don't be tempted to, you know, you, I, I'm, you know, I'm taking this portion, I'll give this to the Lord, you know, in our case, on a weekly basis, let's say, to the church. And a week comes along and you're gone on vacation. Don't consider that, that the Lord's portion goes on vacation with you. It's an old story. No, you know, identify His portion and give the Lord his portion on a regular basis. This is how to develop the exercise, you know, the, the giving muscle, if you wish. Rain and shine, I'm working, I'm not working, I'm here, I'm out of town. The Lord's portion is always set aside. Nothing touches his portion. Number four principle, judgment and giving are related. So be careful. How will you be judged? If today was the day you would be judged, how would you be judged as far as giving is concerned? What would the Lord say to you as far as your giving is concerned? And then principle number five, growth and giving are also related. Everyone here affects our growth as a church by their giving or their not giving. So if you don't regularly give your time or your money or your talent, then you're actually moving the church backwards, not, not, not forward, okay? So if you get anything out of these uh, series on, on giving, it should hopefully uh, bring you to a point where you're asking yourself a question. How is my giving? The thing I really want us to do is to think about our giving, uh, especially you know, married couples. Uh, Lisa and I, we talk about our giving. We discuss it, how are we doing? We get our income tax at the end of the, the year, we get our, our receipts and everything, you know, and uh, we get uh, receipts for our giving to the church and maybe some other things, and we compare it. How did we do this year in, in comparison to last year? And, and what can we do? It's a, like an investment, you know? What, what, can, what can we do next year? What are some of the things we'd like to do or we try to do? What, what portion will we give to the, to the, to the Lord? And perhaps, uh, uh, can we increase it? Is there a way that we increase it? You know, those people who are on a regular income, those on pensions, that's, that's a difficult question. You know, it's different for those who have a business or they're getting bonuses or whatever. You, know, you, have a little, you get some extra, well then you want to give some extra. Nevertheless, uh, I, I, I hope that you will have more sober, spiritual, prayerful discussions about your personal giving uh, for the reason that there is a reward waiting for us, uh, promised by God for those who give regularly and those who give uh, faithfully, for those who give uh, generously. We are rewarded for that and I want all of us to experience that. Okay, so that's the end of our series. I want to thank you for your attention uh, and we'll see you next time in class.